All right. Hi, Susie. Um, I'm Ella. I work for Impress Books. Uh, and Susie Stead uh, is the author of Stephen from the Inside Out, winner of the Impress Prize uh, in 2019, which is due to be published uh, 2nd of April this year on World Autism Day. Um, Hello. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about your new book. Oh, wow. A little bit. Um, <laughs> um, OK, so my book, Stephen from the Inside Out, is about someone I got to know over quite a long period of time. I met him in 2000, um, so I knew him about 18 years. And um, but it was actually not about 12 years after I got to know him that I decided that I was going to write this book about him. And I don't think I had any idea how long it would take or what it would do. But I I think the key thing at the time was um, there was a moment where he just said, you know, my life's been a complete and total waste of time. And I really got to me and I thought I, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to show him that it wasn't. So that's what started me off. And also he's just, he was a really interesting and extraordinary character with a real interesting story. And um, yeah, it was, and as well as I wanted to write about his life, but I also ended up writing about, um, how I got to know him and about the journey of our friendship. Okay. Um, so the, the book is about Stephen's mental health to a degree, um, but his diagnosis fluctuated throughout his life. Hmm. Um, so why did you choose to publish it on World Autism Day? Well, because I think well, he was born in 1955, and in 1955, autism was barely a thing. It was sort of there, but it mm. wasn't really a thing. And um, and he wasn't diagnosed until um, I think he was either 46 or 47 with autism. So he had various other um, mental. Well, no, I won't say uh, uh, he had various other. No, he had various mental illnesses attributed to him. He was diagnosed with various things, but nobody um, had thought about looking at him whether he was autistic until that time, much much later. And in fact, they he was. Um, they said he was had Asperger's, and then now I think he, Asperger's is just seen as what's part of what's on the autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the more I've got to know him, and the more I got to know about autism, the more I think that was his fundamental that was his fundamental thing. And I'm not sure, I'm really interested as to whether all this other stuff, um, whether or not he actually had mental illness or whether or not he was treated like that and actually he ended up in a state that was, it, it almost that the, the way people reacted to him actually created levels of stress and mental illness in him. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. So I do think I feel his fund to me. So my understanding of it is his fundamental diagnosis was autism, and I he that's what he saw. That's what he found really helpful. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and that really helped him recognise the way he just felt really different from other people all his life. Yeah, of course. Do you think he would have been? How do you think he would have felt to see the book finally published? Do you think he would have liked it? Or do you think he would have not? I think, you know, yeah, no, I think he would have been, I think he would have really, really liked it, yeah. And he would have panicked that everybody knew <laughs> about him. It would have been really, and, it, and I, I would have had to make sure that in press press, they would have had to have some legal thing, mm. you know, to protect. So he, because he would have been, he would have had a kind of fear of being, you know, sued or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think he would have been really, really happy. Yeah. That's really lovely. That's really good. Um, what do you think, um, in the book, you know, leading on from what we were saying about mental health or mental mm -hmm. illness even, you, were spe you speak a lot about how it shouldn't be a case of us versus them. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me more about what exactly you mean by that and um, how we can move towards a more collaborative environment of support for people like Stephen? Yeah, that's a big one, big question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Um, yeah, yeah. I suppose because I recognised it in myself, um, there was a sense of me and them. So when I first got to know him, I was a vicar's wife, you know, and I was 
um, I was out there trying to do good and be nice to people. And, um, and I wanted to get out and be, you know, I'm very keen on social justice and stuff like that. And so I saw someone, you know, who I felt sorry for because at the time he was actually under section in a mental hospital and I met him in a drop-in centre when he was at the end of that. So even though you're under section, when you come near the end of it, you, you're then allowed out, you know, mm. for certain times with, um, with certain people. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to be helpful, um, but I kind of saw him as someone who was unwell um, and very separate from me. Mm. And um, so it's taken me quite a long journey, I think, to really realise that, um, there's not that much difference actually and um that you know that if if circumstances completely trance me i could i could end up in a really i could i mean certainly from this point of view of his mental health i mean obviously i don't have autism but from a sense of the levels of stress and reactivity that were there um and also you know with this whole us and them i mean i'd be really interested actually now talking with someone with autism about how that feels because there's definitely that feeling of having to try and fit in with the neurotypical that's what I notice when I'm reading some of the sort of things yeah um, an expectation of a norm of how people should behave and I think particularly I feel and I'm not sure if this is sticking with the us and them but it sort of is is this idea that we're supposed to all behave in a certain way and so if someone doesn't then somehow it's their problem rather than mine it's um, so when Stephen was reacting, so he felt very sensitive to certain sounds and smells, which I now understand is really a part of the autism spectrum. You can be really sensitive to certain things, um, but people would not acknowledge that. So they just think he was being difficult. Um, and um, so rather than acknowledging what was that, that this might be true for him, that he's telling something about what his experience is. And so how can we support him? No, he's them. He's someone else who's not behaving how he should be. I, I think I'm trying to sort of struggle towards that. And um, and that also there was this whole thing about his behaviour um, and that somehow he should behave differently. And, and I had this at the beginning, because why can't you just try a bit? You know, why can't you just sort of make an effort <laughs> or, you know, not react so much? And it's mm. like, actually, no, what's happening is this person is really frightened and and I don't know what's going on behind them. And I'm just, um, I'm, I'm just treating them like they're, they're not capable. Whereas actually it's not, I'm just not understanding what is actually triggering them. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm very, very clear, but. No, um, you are, you absolutely are. I think that's one of the clearest through lines in the book. Um, and as well, you speak a lot about um, sort of British stiff upper lip culture yes. as well, uh, which I imagine, is part of that as well. Um, I don't think we talk about or are used to talking about traditionally mental health. Um, and, you know, you speak about repressing past traumas and that sort of thing. And do you think that's something you're still struggling with or thinking about? Well, for myself personally. <laughs> yeah, or, or generally. Well, I've been doing um, some stuff around mindfulness and trauma. It's called trauma sensitive mindfulness. And this chap says that if you're in a room with a bunch of people, you are amongst people who are struggling with trauma. You can't be in a room with 10 people and not be in a room with some people struggling with trauma. Mm. So I feel this. Uh, so, so some sense of acknowledging that there's, there is trauma around. And certainly by the end of this pandemic, there's going to be a lot of unsorted out trauma yeah. from people who were supposed to have just held it together while someone who they love has died or yeah yeah or well, they haven't seen people for ages and um so I really hope that some of that will be allowed out the difficulty is that uh, mental health in the NHS is a Cinderella of an organization that's already a Cinderella in terms of how the government funds things. So the NHS is a Cinderella. We're not putting the money in we should do. And the mental health is a Cinderella part of the NHS. Yeah. So we're not providing anything like what is necessary to support people. 
So unless you have money to play a psychotherapist, £100 an hour, mm. <laughs> there's not that much. They do offer mindfulness for depression. There are certain pockets and things, but it's really, really limited. Mm. Um, and so, I, yeah, I just... I find so then it's really difficult, you know, and also there's not an education. Yeah, as I say, we're not, as you say, we're not, that's not one of the things we ta were taught at school, how to, how to, how to, how to socialize with other people, how to listen, how to listen. Yeah. <laughs> that's quite massive, you know, or yeah. how to manage it when, um, and someone is distressed. I don't know. I just feel like there's a whole area that could be really, really rich for us to, mm to actually help um, children and adult and teenagers in being with what's really difficult. Mm -hmm. And acknowledge it. Yeah, cause I, no, I agree. I think there's still a lot of repression because there's a whole load of how you should and shouldn't behave. Yeah. Um, it's interesting as well that you mentioned um, sort of the NHS because um, a lot of the book is about um, the history of mental uh, like health legislation in this country um what made you want to go deep into that alongside Stephen's story oh well I'd like to sort of just add because I don't it, it's in, it, it's there but I wouldn't say I mean no. it's kind of a backbone but it's not a central part Kate mm -hmm. Clancy actually told me she said I think you should put it in the context of um the history of mental health and I really enjoyed doing it and what happened was I read read huge amount Mm. then wrote huge amounts and then had to cut huge amounts yeah. um, because also what Kate said when she was reading one of the drafts was you know you need a lot of story and a little bit of fact I mean as in history so mm. so I had to keep cutting stuff out so that um, so that you still have the flow of the story as well as um, the history um, yeah. but, but it was basically her um, but then I got that really found that really interesting because um, yeah. I had no idea about what how how recent in some ways some of our exploration of mental health has been mm. and certainly around autism how recent it has been mm. and like the whole thing about oh, um, I'm trying to remember which bills they are but the kind of bill called the idiots bill and then you know it's, <laughs> this whole thing about kids being called maladjusted and um, just the terminology of that time and and actually how little was done mm. for children for so long yeah so it's kind of really relatively recent and then a huge shift, you know, in terms of like nothing being around for people with autism. And then it's, uh, and then now it's, there's a lot more, I mean, I'm hoping there's, there's definitely a lot more acknowledgement of, of autism as mm. um, a characteristic and what's here. Um, and also I'm hoping there's a lot more support. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it was really, yeah, no, it was really interesting. And also there was lots of stuff I had to cut out because um, there's a really fascinating woman called Temple Grandin and mm. she is, um, her mother wasn't, she was in the 50s and 60s that had this idea that um, that women, mothers who had children who had any kind of issues were uh, what they call refrigerator mothers and particularly anyone who in the end, they, when they under, began to understand autism. Yeah. And she kind of ignored that and she decided she was going, she had money. So she paid a lot of money for Temple Grandin to, um, to have sort of real support. And um, Temple Grandin has become, a, she's become really able in around horse care and things like that. And she's actually quite an extraordinary woman and worth looking up. Oh, well, um, that sounds really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Um, I suppose you know, leading on from that, uh, do you want to talk a bit about sort of your writing process, um, both for this book and for previous um work you've done? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I've written some sort of some. T uh, interestingly, I started writing sketches and drama about the same time that I met Stephen. Um, so I've done a lot of writing of short sketches and drama within church and community and school settings. Um, and then I did write, a kind of ghost writ, wrote a sort of bug, autobiography with someone when he was 90. And it was much simpler. I just went, he visited me, we re-recorded our conversations, I transcribed them and then I edited it. And I did that all in about four months. 
And I, I think I had this idea I was going to do something similar with Stephen. <laughs> um, and so what would happen was I would go and visit Stephen um, every six weeks once we decided on this process. Um, and I lived 100 miles away. So I would drive down to meet him. Mm. And, um, and then... I, and then around that time, he decided that he'd like to go out for a meal. So then I would take him out for a meal. And then it would depend. Sometimes he would feel like me asking him questions and sometimes he wouldn't. Um, so then I would record our conversations. And then I'd go home and then I'd transcribe the conversations. Um, and I also recorded all our phone calls. Um, and then eventually I wrote chapters from that. I began to write chapters from that. I had a huge amount of material. Mm. Uh, and, and once I'd started writing the chapters, then I started reading them back to Stephen. So then I would come back and I'd read him some of the chapters and he would comment. And then I would mark his comments in and, uh, and then I would sometimes add them to the text. So um, yeah, so that's how it all gradually um, unfolded. And then sometimes I would just, also I've got diary entries because I would occasionally write diary entries. And when I was writing the book, I went back because I went back to 2000. So obviously I wasn't writing about him back then mm -hmm. um, to find some of the stuff that I wrote about him at the time. Sure. Um, well, so really yes, and it was also really awkward because I was writing a book about him, but then his life was also happening. So it was... It was taking several years to write the book because it was quite a slow process. But his life was also unfurling. And then I was forgetting to write about this bit, the bit that I was, when I was coming to visit him. Um, so sometimes I would write about it because it was really interesting, like the very first pub visit we went on or, mm. you know, because it was really eye-opening for me when for me going to a pub is a really simple process and you just show up, you know, order something, have a drink and eat. And it really isn't simple when this whole process is fraught with all sorts of complexity around, um, you know, not knowing what the rules are mm. um, and what is happening. And why is this person taking a chair away from our table to go to their table? That's not right. And um, why is the food taking so long? And yeah, I just it was really eye opening to see how something I take for granted is not so simple for someone else. Mm. I think that's one of the things you do really well in the book is is uh, sort of balance being really honest about times you were frustrated with him um, mm -hmm. and his behaviour with you know your growing understanding of his the way his mind worked mm -hmm. um, and I really I think as well the form that you choose of of having him comment back on the chapters is works really well and was one of the things I liked most about it when I first read it um, because obviously the ethics of writing another person's story for them particularly if they're autistic or, or have other mental health Ill, illness issues um, you know can be quite thorny um, and it's a really good way of making it a collaborative book you know in a way knowing that he had input Mm. Um, yeah mm, yeah yeah no it felt really good and um it was also quite interesting because I felt when I was editing it then I began also noticing when I suddenly realized I'm editing this from my point of view <laughs> um and this isn't his point of view yeah <laughs> um especially yeah because the last few chapters, uh, I didn't have the benefit of him being able to read them. So, um, um, so it was. You know, but by then, I'm 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 getting the hang of I'm getting the working of this. So that was really useful for me to really see. You no, know, this isn't about me. This book. This is about him. Yeah. And um, his viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Also, I think it is helpful. I mean, I think I kind of like this idea of having both sides because I know that you know that. Um, the sense that we are both, you know, whoever we are, whether we uh, call ourselves neurotypical or not neurotypical or call ourselves mentally well or not mentally well, you know, we have our different baggage and how we struggle. And um, so it's really important that it's not about us feeling, I don't know, just 
that we're trying to work together to find something rather than, uh, oh my God, I'm so awful as a human being. You know, I'm just, I'm just being me. And in the process of mixing with someone else, something changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the difficulty is if I then feel shamed that I'm supposed, you know, I'm supposed to be this perfect right on human being and, and I'm not. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wrote it partly. And I was trying to be as honest as I could about me because I really wasn't. And I wasn't aware that I wasn't being right on. I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, why can't you just... And it was really, I thought it was really helpful. I remember the one point when I think I said something, you know, well, why can't you just try a bit? <laughs> and he said, what you mean? You know, just make an effort. And I'm going, yes. <laughs> and he's going, I can't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um and i lovely somebody lovely i knew and her um her, her brother was schizophrenic and she said i know i know i'm not i know what he's like you know but i still want to say just try you know just pull your socks up even though i know it's this is stupid it's just what's coming up in me you know the mm -hmm. wanting something to be wanting them because you want them to be okay you don't want them to be putting themselves in a really painful place and it's really hard because I couldn't help him. So he's with this halfway house, he's with his staff and they're telling him, if you don't behave, we're going to section you. And I don't have control over those people. And mm -hmm. I, how do, I, but I don't have control over him, but I'm kind of saying, you know, just try a bit. And, I, and that's useless. I can't, that's not helpful for me. You know, what I probably needed to do was go and see them and say, you're the professionals, you know, um, mm. you're the ones who are supposed to know what to do. So doing this to it. You know, even I know this is really stupid mm. to keep threatening him. Um, yeah. And all you're doing is making him far more anxious. Um, so, um, but at the time, you know, I just felt really upset because I didn't want, I didn't want him sectioned. I knew he was hysterical about the idea of ever being sectioned again. Yeah. And yet how, what was he supposed to do? Mm. He, he wasn't, no, yeah. So it was, um, I thought I definitely didn't have the wisdom at the time, but it was a difficult situation and yeah, what to, how, how one responds or finds a way. Yeah. But, and like, sometimes, yeah, go on. No, you, what were you going to say? Well, and also this thing sometimes that we're trying so busy to sort people out and actually they don't want sorting out. Yeah. Um, they want to be listened to. And I think that really took a long time for me you know, to know that, you see someone and you have an idea of what's wrong and how they should be sorted mm. and you haven't asked them <laughs> what, what what would you like what would support you and yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean and there's a lot in that sort of vein in the book of people sort of um asking Stephen or trying to get Stephen to do things that you wouldn't ask another adult to do you know stuff like trying to get him to stop smoking and things like that when he didn't want to and that's yeah. up to him ultimately mm. um but there's sort of this dissonance between what they expect of someone mm. who's been sectioned versus someone who hasn't you know yeah yeah which i found really interesting and didn't know very much about mm. and that whole sense of how much your rights are taken from you yeah, yeah. exactly mm. like just completely completely stripped from him mm. um mm. like the really one of the most moving bits of the book is towards the end um i mean maybe this is a bit spoilery uh mm. but uh, with his attachment to his flat um mm. and how important it was for him to have that space for him and his dog uh, and his garden and stuff like that and and you know you portray this one of the many sort of medical professionals in his life who um decides that's not the best thing for him hmm. and how sort of you and almost everyone else in Stephen's life had to kind of try to fight it and it hmm. still didn't hmm. you know, still didn't work hmm. Hmm. which seems incredibly unjust hmm. um, and I think that's um I think I realize more and more that's the thing I find um I feel the most strongly about that the right of a person and their own agency yeah and um uh and this the, what i react really really badly to and i'm and in myself when i'm doing it mm. this is when i think i know what should be done for someone else yeah 
and um, and yeah, uh, and I love there's something in this friend of mine Zeke who's, who used to be a social worker and he said and I, he put it more fruitfully than others in the actual legislation, but mm-hmm. that a person has a right to live as shit a life as they like, <laughs> <laughs> um, even if it's not one that you particularly you yeah. know subscribe to, but they have that right and um, and it, and unless you can prove that they you know, have no capacity, you know, they, they're just not capable of making a decision about their own welfare, mm-hmm. then they have that right to do so. That, just because they live in a way that you don't agree with, that's not a good reason. Absolutely. For, for taking what they what matters to them away from them. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, uh, and that I feel really, very strongly about. I mean, I think, you know, partly because I just the thought of that happening to me, of someone deciding what they thought was best for me and not asking me. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That that is absolutely sort of one of the strongest messages I think you get from the book. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm glad. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's certainly one of the main things I took away from it was sort of outrage <laughs> on behalf of this man, um, mm-hmm. as well as, you know, um, really enjoying your own sort of the depiction of your relationship with him and, and the way you both grew. Um, mm. I think you also do a really good job of, yeah, engendering outrage for that kind of situation. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any other sort of plans for future writing projects is there anything any ideas that you have at the moment or have you been focusing mostly on, on Stephen um well yes it's largely um I mean there's a few things I've written that I could do with publishing I'd really like to actually or have them put on um just you know minor things that I'd like to put on have put on at the national that's all um <laughs> but also I have um I'd like to do something filmic maybe with a with a story that I have in my head, um, which is to do with the linden tree and um, and the, and the, there's some myths around the linden tree and stuff that I've loved and I've written a story around that. But um, and also I have this I don't write this sort of stuff, but I dreamt a rather fabulous horror story and I'd really like to, <laughs> I'd like to create it. I'm not sure whether it should be a book or a film. Um, but it relates, and I and I realise later, I'm kind of interested in it, and it's in, and the base sort of really sort of nugget of it is that um, there's this curse on people, and everybody's drawn to this one place once a year, and at a certain point over several hours, suddenly these terrible, terrible wounds appear, and they're just screaming, and ter- and it's awful, and so it's a bit of a nightmare scenario, and people obviously don't know what's happening and so we're panicking and then the um, end of the curse ends and then all the wounds just cover up and they just go home and it's the idea of that that the wounds that we hide and they're held inside and they fester and every now and then they come out and they just scare the shit out of people <laughs> <laughs> and generally it means that we don't get a good response so you know and then it gets closed down again mm. and then we go off and mm. I kind of really you know so um so, so I kind of quite like playing with that. That sounds really fun. That sounds really yeah. interesting. I mean, I really hate horror films. I've had, I've got made a <laughs> short film actually, which runs several awards, but um, it's quite dark. And mm. um, and this friend of mine said, "Why do you write all these dark things? You seem such a cheery sort of person." <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what's inside me. <laughs> so, yeah. So I did promise him I'd write something more cheery um, later afterwards, but that doesn't sound much more cheery. I'll leave it for another time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds really interesting. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say about Stephen before we finish? Um, no, I suppose just... I don't, I don't think it took me... I think, you know, now it, it's taken me a while since he's died to really process knowing him and mm. um, and how much, you know, just how precious he was. And and I think one of the things that strikes me sometimes is that you don't know what 
you don't know that something important is happening. You know, you have this idea about what's important in your life or what important things you're going to do. And then you do something that you don't think is important. And then it turns out to be one of the most significant things. So I just chose to invite him to coffee once a week in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I didn't think, you know, I'd just help him out for a bit and then he'd be on his way. I mean, <laughs> that was it. And I, <laughs> I didn't see it as anything significant. And even when I knew him over 12 years, I was thinking, you know, why am I, st what's that? why are we still here? And then after a while, okay, <laughs> but yeah, you know. Um, but it, but realizing it wasn't so much later that I realized, wow, he has become a really, really important and significant part of my life and um, for which I'm really grateful. But I just, I'm just finding it fascinating that we have this idea. I had this idea of what was really mattering and what doesn't matter. And then, oh, okay. I suddenly realized that was really important, that part of my life. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure, but I just think that's really to be open to those people and those things that don't seem important and discover that actually they really are. Well, that's really... That's really lovely. <laughs> thank you. Um, and thank you for speaking to us about your upcoming book. Thank you. All right.